I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome back to the Sky News Daily, where we are, in essence, picking up where we left off yesterday, where, where I concluded that we are living in dangerous times. Take, for example, a belligerent Russia and its war with Ukraine, at China sabre-rattling off the coast of Taiwan, Israel levelling vast swathes of Gaza in its pursuit of Hamas, and, of course, the retaliatory action that we've seen from Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Houthis in Yemen. We also shouldn't forget continuing instability across vast areas of Africa, the stranglehold that narcotics cartels have in Central America, the rise of the far right in Europe, also something we should be concerned about. And so General Sir Patrick Sanders, the head of the army, well, he said back in 2022 that we were facing a 1937 moment, referencing, of course, that period leading up to the Second World War, where some countries, certainly not all, ramped up their spending on defence. Now, with just six months left in his role as Chief of the General Staff, Sir Patrick has issued another warning that such is the state of the army, if the country were to go to war, the public would have to be called up to fight. In a word, and for many it is an uncomfortable word, conscription. Uh, we will be getting the views in a little while of Sky's military analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Um, but first, though, we'll bring in Sir Michael Fallon, who was appointed Defence Secretary by uh, David Cameron back in 2014 and held the post until his resignation in 2017. Uh, Sir Michael, great to have you on the podcast. I suppose we should start first and foremost with, with the comments of General Sanders. I mean, is, is, he, is he accurate? If the United Kingdom were to go to war right now, would conscription be required? Well, first of all, we should listen to him. He's mm. our most senior soldier. He's a general that I listened to a lot when I worked in the Ministry of Defence. And we should uh, take his warning extremely seriously. Second, you know, the, the services, particularly the Army and the Navy, are under-recruited at the moment. They're under strength. And there have been issues with um, uh, getting enough crews onto the Royal Navy ships and making sure that you know we have enough troops to be able to send them where they're needed around the world. So it's a warning, and it's a warning we should pay heed to. It, is it a warning, though, that, that, that is absolutely timely? Have these problems not existed within the armed forces for, for some time, in fact? Yes, I think there's always been a problem when uh, we're no longer fighting as a country and we stopped uh, active military operations, if you remember, Back in Afghanistan, we stopped those in 2014. So mm. for 10 years now, we haven't been out there ourselves with our troops fighting on the ground. And recruitment then is always slightly more difficult when people can't see um, an active pattern to, to join. And uh, I think there has been a continuing problem of not making sure that uh, our service people are paid enough, are housed well enough, and they have the kind of flexible employment that younger people are looking for now. So, you know, the, the, the Army and the Navy, they've got to up their offer and make their careers, you know, more and more attractive because they're competing in a shrinking demographic. They're competing for talent against uh, many other opportunities. And, of course, it's not just the, the regulars that there's a problem with. The reserve forces as well are a problem highlighted by General Sanders. I mean, I, I thought that the, the, the plan was that as we were drawing down the numbers in the regulars, the reservists would be, would be boosted and, and that would be the bulwark. That was certainly the, the plan. Hmm. Um, but, it, you know, there has been an issue with recruiting sufficient reserves. It takes, still takes a long time to join the reserves. It still takes a long time... To, to join the army. You know, we need to look at why it takes so long and, and speed these things up because there's no doubt, you know, we are competing in terms of the career offer. We're competing with other very attractive careers and we need to make sure that younger people feel that uh, if they do sign up, then they're going to be properly looked after. So, so is conscription then the answer? Well, a number of European countries, interestingly, are now looking at part conscrip conscription. Even France has mm. been looking at, you know, encouraging some form of military service for younger people when they when they leave college. And, you know, you can have this, um, you know, either way, if you don't boost defense spending sufficiently, and we haven't been in a time of, you know, multiple wars and conflicts like this. Uh, we haven't been at this point, you know, at any point this century until now. If you don't boost defense spending to be able to crew your ships and to have troops available, then you've got to look at more uh, at, at other methods. And sooner or later, 
you know, if the, if the military can't improve the way they recruit, then uh, if it comes to conflict, obviously they will have to look at other methods. It, it was one of the things that Donald Trump did get right when it came to, to NATO, that there were plenty of, of member states that were not contributing enough to their defence spending. The mantra from, from central government here has always been that, that we have done so. So we presumably need to be spending significantly more then, going by what you're saying, than 2% of GDP. Yes, 2% was the minimum. Mm. And that target, by the way, was set back in 2014 at a mm. NATO summit in Wales. And we all agreed we would spend 2% by 2024. That's this year. It was a 10-year target. But if you look at NATO, you find that only nine of the 30 members actually spend 2%. We're one of the good guys. But uh, at least half of NATO doesn't even spend 1.5%. Mm. And this isn't, by the way, something that just Trump invented. This was Obama who was at the Wales summit saying you've got to spend more. The Americans have been saying this for a very long time. And, you know, I'm pleased we are spending 2% in line with the target. I think we're spending 2.1% now. But uh, really, we do need uh, across Europe to be spending more now. We have a war going on on our own continent. We have our own trade route uh, being uh, attacked in the, in, the, in the Red Sea. So, you know, we are at risk unless we boost our defence. We'll return to the money in just a second, but, but as you say, recruitment into the forces has been an issue. How much of a problem has retention been? Well, retention is an issue. I think, you know, the old idea when you, you joined up for maybe 20, 30 years, you learn to trade and you might have a, a short career after that, after you'd retired from the army, or, um, or, or you might just simply retire. That's gone now. You know, I think younger people are looking uh, for more flexibility. They're looking to be able to change what they're doing in their 30s and their 40s. They don't want to be locked away for very long periods of employment. So the whole thing, I'm afraid, has got to be more flexible than the military have been used to. We started a bit of that in my time, but that is the answer. It's got to be better pay, better housing, better allowances, and a more flexible career structure so that people can leave and then perhaps come back again after they've done something else on the civilian side. I mean, clearly Sir Patrick is no fan of conscription, and indeed, you know, from, from the military people that I know, it, it, it almost to a man and a woman, that would not be a path that they would wish to would wish to pursue. Where do you stand on the issue, and and why is it something that senior military figures always seem to to kind of push back against? Well, they do push back against it, and they don't just push back against conscription. They also push back any idea of reintroducing national service mm -hmm. for people, you know, of, of of that age group that we only abolished, you know, fifty years ago. Uh, they've always pushed back on that because they don't want unwilling recruits. You know, they'd much rather keep the services as professional as they can and have people who, who literally want to join, want to put them, themselves and, uh, uh, at risk on behalf of other people. And that's the ethos that, uh, that the services operate from. But the problem now is the numbers are getting, you know, in my view, are getting dangerously low. We see the army now reduced again in strength. The army is under-recruited anyway. It hasn't recruited up to the level that some regiment should be at. And we have some serious shortages in the Navy. So, you know, Sir Patrick is right that unless we address the budget issue uh, and agree that what, whatever the other priorities are, and there are certainly plenty of other claims for more spending, whatever those priorities are, the first priority for any government must be to make sure our defence is sound, and that means a bigger budget. And, and when you use a phrase like, you know, dangerously low in, in, in relation to protection of the realm, I, I suppose what the, the, the point you are making is that if this continues, the country is not safe, that the government is failing in one of its most fundamental responsibilities to protect its people. Yes, we have to protect our people, and that means protecting their energy supplies in the Middle East. That means protecting our trade routes uh, when it comes to the uh, Red Sea. And that means we have an interest, too, in helping to protect democracies in Europe and ensuring that somebody like Putin doesn't continue to invade other countries, because we now know, we learned twice in the last century, where that leads. So, yes, government does have a duty to keep people safe, and we're at a very dangerous point now, I think the most dangerous point in this century so far. Oh dear. Um, well, so, when, so when the Chief of the, the General Staff uh, makes this point, it, it surely rests on us going to war with Russia. Do you feel that that is, that is not the remote possibility that 
I would argue most of the British public probably think it is right now. Well, you didn't you didn't find it remote if you were living in Ukraine a couple mm -hmm. of years ago when the Russians came over the border. It wasn't remote when they invaded uh, Georgia. It hasn't been remote when they've mounted cyber attacks on other countries, including including the Baltic states. So this is real. This is happening now on our continent. We see a very direct threat. Obviously, they've invaded Ukraine, but there's a threat to again to Georgia, to Moldova, and indeed to to the Baltic states. If you go to the Baltic states, I visit these. I still continue to visit these uh, Eastern uh, European countries. Uh, they feel very threatened by what is happening in Ukraine. And they are very clear that unless we help there, unless we defend democracy on that side of Europe, sooner or later, we're going to be under threat ourselves. So, so where has the contingency planning been? I mean, thinking even back to your time at, at main building of the MOD, you know, occasionally stories would make their way into the press that would be used to, to, to beat the defence secretary, which, which was just proper contingency planning for remote possibilities, but contingency planning none, nonetheless. I mean, at the moment, we have two aircraft carriers doing hee-haw. We have an army that has been taken down to historically low levels. I mean, the, the, the Navy just in general is nowhere near the capacity of, that it had, even a handful of years ago, in fact. Why has this been allowed to happen, do you think? Well, the, the defence defense definitely suffered under the austerity cuts that were mm -hmm. necessary back in 2010. If you remember the financial crisis then, there were cuts right across the public services and defence had to take a share of that. In my time, we started to reverse that. We started to increase the defence budget. We started to build more ships. These things take a long time to, uh, to turn round. Uh, but there's no question now that since then, the, the world has become a more dangerous place. And um, in terms of contingency, we need to have troops ready to commit on exercises across NATO. We need to plan for how we would reinforce NATO in the East, how we would deploy RAF jets, not just uh, in the Middle East, but also across, uh, across Europe. And we need more ships. We need ships in the Baltic. We need ships in the Mediterranean. We need ships in the Gulf. So, you know, the, the contingency planning that was done is very real now. We, we, we you know, the, all three services, I think, are being very stretched at the moment. Do you think that if the worst happened and that conscription were required, that the, 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 the young people, the young men and women of this country would be up to the task in the way in which previous generations were? Well, that question actually is asked of every generation. Mm -hmm. And we were told, I remember, you know, when it was unfashionable to support the military in the 60s and 70s, that, you know, young people wouldn't step forward. Uh, if you look at what happened in the Falklands, for example, if you look at the average age of those who actually fought in the Falklands, and they were not conscripted, by the way, they were all people who stepped forward to serve in the Army or Navy or Air Force. The average age was in the very low 20s. I think it was around 21. And there was no doubting then, you know, the calibre and bravery of our young people who did come and, uh, and, and step forward at a time of, of danger when we had an invasion of uh, what, it, what is British territory. So, uh, you know, I don't doubt the younger generation. I'm not sure it needs to come to conscription. I think mm. when, it, you know, when the, when the chips are down, when people see the, the, the dangers that do threaten our country, I hope they will realise that um, um, the armed forces, you know, uh, are, are a necessary part of our life now and we do need to, to restock them. Uh, the Conservative Tobias Elwood, man you, I'm sure you will know well, has said that our world is no longer at peace. We are now moving to a world at war. I mean, do you, do you agree with that? And are, are, you, as, are you as concerned as, as I now am about the state of the world, the prospect of conflict, the prospect of, of regional and global conflict, in fact, I would say? Well, yes, I think everybody's concerned now. You know, we have two wars going on, one on our own continent, another in the Middle East. We have our principal trading route now uh, in conflict, being attacked uh, in the Red Sea. And we have rogue states like Iran and North Korea uh, happily developing, uh, you know, ballistic uh, missiles. So we have, and we have, you know, the rise of the threat from China to Taiwan and, and the in the Indo-Pacific. So we have multiple threats which now seem to be merging. Uh, we have, you know, the Hamas being received in, in Moscow. We have North Korea supplying weapons into Ukraine. These um, conflicts now seem to be merging. This is a very dangerous moment. And that's why in the end, you know, we should listen 
to our professional advisers and they don't come any more senior than General Sir Patrick Sanders. These warnings from General Sanders certainly haven't appeared out of thin air. I mean, here's what he was saying all the way back in 2022. This is our 1937 moment. We're not at war, but we must act rapidly so that we aren't drawn into one through a failure to contain territorial expansion. So surely it's beholden on each of us to ensure that we never find ourselves asking that futile question, should we have done more? And the concerns that he expressed there, uh, well, frankly, plenty have shared them even before that point in time. Let's bring in uh, Professor Michael Clark, our defence and security analyst. First, that which we heard from, from, from Michael Fallon, he is a man who knows a thing or two about defence. And and he, I, I think he identified the problems pretty accurately, that there has been underspending, that the, the armed forces have been allowed to diminish mm. pretty much across the board. Yes, I mean, the, the armed forces have kept... Um, so sort of top of the range equipment. I mean, what we try to do in British defence is to keep full spectrum forces, so we can do a little bit of everything. We can we can imitate what the Americans do, at about five or six percent of the of the extent of what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is that when you try to do a little bit of everything, you end up doing it with very low numbers, and add that to the economic crisis that we've had, as Sir Michael said, since two thousand eight and mm -hmm. two thousand ten. The defence review of that t of that year made eight percent cuts in defence, which wasn't as great as the cuts elsewhere, incidentally, but 8% cuts are 8% cuts, and defence has been struggling to recover ever since. The PM spokesman has been asked about uh, ruling out conscription in future circumstances. PM spokesman saying there's no suggestion of conscription, government's no intention of following through with that. Uh, the British military has a proud tradition of being a voluntary force, no plans to change that. I mean, why, why does the military dislike conscription just so much? Well, because it, it's almost never done it. I mean, the, the, the British Army, if you want to say, when did the British Army start? The date is May 1660, right, on Blackheath. Right, of course. Right? Yeah. So General Monk mm -hmm. took the army to Blackheath. Charles II, in mm -hmm. restoration, was passing through Blackheath on his way to London to become king after Cromwell. Mm -hmm. And the army paraded on Blackheath and pledged themselves to him in May 1660. Now, that was 364 years ago. Of those years, we've only had conscription for 25 of those years. So we've only had conscription between 1916, middle of the First World War, and 1920, when it was ended, and then again 1939, beginning of the Second World War, through to 1960, mm -hmm. when it was ended. So only 25 of those 360-odd years we've had conscription. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's completely antithetical to the British thinking on the military. I mean, it's always dressed up. It's always dressed up as this generation wouldn't be able to do it. This generation wouldn't be able to hack it. But, you know, it's, I, I assume you think, and, and we certainly heard it from, yeah. uh, from Sir Michael, actually when push comes to shove, there have always been young people, you know, healthy in body, fit in mind as well, ready to stand up and serve their country. Absolutely right. And what Patrick Sanders was saying, he said, look, people get confused about this. He said, we're going to have to go back to a citizen army. Mm. That's not the same as conscription. True. Remember, in the First World War, we first of all had the old contemptibles, which is the professional army that went to Mons and mm. First Ypres, and they were destroyed by that in 1914, 1915. We then had a citizen volunteer army. That was Kitchener's army that was destroyed at the Battle of the Somme. And then we had a citizen conscript army after that, which was the army that won the First World War. It was the best army on the Western Front, by far. It really learned, and that was the most triumphant army Britain's ever fielded. And that was a citizen conscript army. And what Patrick Sanders is saying about is, is saying, look, we'll, we'll have to go back to bigger forces. It'll need to be a citizen army, but a citizen volunteer army of the sort that we've had in the past, and we will probably have to have one again in the future. Because if you look at what's happening in Europe, I mean, forget the rest of the world for now, in Europe, the, the, big, the big ground forces are Germany, Poland, and, the, and the, the Scandinavian countries. They will have big forces when they mobilise. We will never have big forces, but we need to have bigger forces in order to fit in with the big forces that may be required in the next decade or so as we face Russian uh, pressure, let's put it that way. I mean, it was a, it was a topic that I raised with, with um, Sir Michael, the, that of contingency planning. And mm. it, it just it frustrates me and it puzzles me that we have found ourselves in a situation where, you know, the head of the army, of all things, is saying, I don't have the numbers. And in fact, he's been banging this drum for a lot longer he than has, just as... Since, just, you, since you took over. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not as if 
the risks that we are currently seeing at the moment have not been entirely anticipated, but with yeah. the possible exception of you know Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. But we knew that Russia was more active on the eastern frontier than it had been. We knew that there were problems when it came to the Middle East, of, of, of all things. And yet, whilst there have been document after document, restructuring after restructuring, we still don't seem to know what it is that, we, A, we want our military to do, and be how to how to fund it properly. Because when we have these strategic discussions, yeah. and they go on all, every night around Westminster in mm -hmm. dinners, that, some of which I go to, and we're all talking about the same sorts of things. There's no lack of understanding amongst current politicians either. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands it, but when it comes to practical politics, that's always five and ten years away, um, whereas the particular problems of what are we going to do about this expenditure, that expenditure, this programme, the Ajax um, uh, military fighting vehicle, the armoured fighting vehicle, which is a bit of a mess of procurement, what are we mm -hmm. going to do about that? The immediate problems always take precedence. And the point is, again, I mean, what Patrick Sanders was saying, and this is a really important distinction, we're not trying to work ourselves into a war mentality mm -hmm. here. What he's saying is that we have to be prepared to send an army to Europe that is capable, really capable, of fighting the Russians so that we don't have to. Mm -hmm. If we send an army to Europe that's a paper tiger, the Russians will see through it immediately. It will have no effect. And so if we send an army to Europe that is genuinely capable of fighting with our allies a Russian attack on NATO, the Russians will see that, and there's a fairly good chance we won't have to fight. Mm -hmm. So deterrence is, is the key to this strategy, but to be efficiently a deterrent, it's got to be credible. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we're not credible. We've fallen below what I always call the threshold of, uh, the, the, the threshold of strategic significance. So when British forces, Army, Navy, or Air Force, when they go abroad, when they go and do everything, they're always very welcome because they do what they do extremely well. But they, we've fallen below the threshold where it makes any difference. We're always welcome. But the fact is, can you ever deploy enough force to, to turn the strategic dial to make a difference? And the idea is we used to. We haven't in the last 10 or 20 years. Clearly, we are all concerned about the level of conflict that there exists in this world right now, and particularly a President Putin who, not at the end of his life, but perhaps in the, the closing stages of his political career, with not much to show from what has happened in Ukraine so far. I mean, uh, genuinely, how concerned should I be about the prospect of war with Russia? I think we should be genuinely concerned about the prospect of a military confrontation with Russia mm -hmm. in Europe in ways that it certainly affects our allies and may affect us directly. Mm -hmm. The point is what Putin has showed since 2022 is that he's crossed a line and he's, he's now committed. Maybe he didn't in, intend this, but he is. That's where he is now. Mm -hmm. He's crossed the line. He's invaded a neighbour very overtly. He'd done it before, but he, he, I mean, he was always the playground bully before who was actually rather careful how far he went with these sort of boasts and threats and backed off. In 2022, he didn't back off. He did it. He's got himself into a terrible mess. And as we know from the last you know, couple of hundred years or so, the way in which, which dictators recover from one blunder is usually to make another one somewhere else. Mm. They, they're on track. They're on a track. And he is on a track where he has to now show that he is going to either die or re retire or whatever um, as one of the great Russians of the 20th, 21st century, in line with Stalin, mm -hmm. Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. That's how he sees himself. And he wants something to show for that. If not in Ukraine, then in northwestern Europe, in the Baltics, mm -hmm. against Finland, in the North Atlantic, in the Arctic. Um, which matters tremendously to the North Atlantic and our trade routes, and possibly, possibly um, in Central Europe as well, bringing back into the fold those territories that used to be Soviet Empire territories, which he thinks should all be uh, influenced by uh, Russia. T time is clearly of the essence then, and, and of course when it comes to procurement particularly, but also recruiting and training kind of uh, personnel to go into the military, it, it all takes time. So, Michael, if you were in charge of the next Strategic Defence and Security Review, how would you reshape it? What would you be doing? What would you be arguing? Well, we've got to get past the four-year spending uh, commitment that the government made, which runs out this year. Four years ago, they made a, quite a big commitment to increase expenditure, but that would actually just filled in a bit of the black hole. Mm. So we've got to move, in my view, to, say, 3% of GDP on defence. 
And historically, that would be back towards average. We've got to assume that that is the case. And then we've really got to recruit not so much more equipment. We need more numbers of certain equipments, but we need more people. We've got to have more people, and that's this, fundamental. But this, this, this was the thing, the statistic that, that, that leapt out to me today. You know, we're, we're on track for the military, for the size of the army to be roughly 70,000 in the not-too-distant future. Mm. That is the number of special forces, yeah. uh, special yeah. forces uh, staff that the United States has. Yeah, and think about this. During the Cold War, mm -hmm. all through the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, our army was about 180,000, 180,000, mm -hmm. not 70,000. And of that, 60,000 were the British Army of the Rhine, you know, left over from the Second World War sitting yep. in central Germany or northern Germany. And the point is that, that everybody says, um, including our own defence secretary, including the secretary, Gen the secretary of the NATO Military Committee, the German defence minister, the uh, Norwegian, uh, Danish and um, uh, Finnish uh, chiefs of defence staff, they all say we're moving back into a Cold War situation in Europe. And so we've got to think in terms of maybe going back to um, saying that the peace dividend is over and we've got to actually spend more and, and most importantly we've got to restructure ourselves on the assumption that we've got to go back to a credible deterrent in Europe. All these things I've said about Putin, you know, the, the way Putin might go, are much more likely if we, if we carry on as we are. If we're prepared to go back towards a Cold War um, establishment, and it's, I don't like saying that, but I think that's where we are for the next 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. then we've got a better chance of deterring what would otherwise be more likely to happen. And well, let's, let, let's talk about events happening in the past 24 hours. I mean, with Donald Trump's you know, win in, I think it was New Hampshire, I mean, he mm -hmm. edges ever close to being the Republican nominee, edges ever close to the White House. And you and I both know that if he is the next president, the future of NATO as an organisation is under significant doubt. Yes. I mean, I think that, I mean, Trump has, is no friend of NATO no. and he, he thought seriously about trying to withdraw America last time from it. I mean, withdrawal from NATO would take a while, but if he announced it, then it would start to have an effect. And I think if Trump were re-elected, I think NATO, as we know it now, mm -hmm. would start to self-destruct because um, certain countries would immediately start to do deals with Russia on the assumption that NATO would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And so they'll, they'll pull away from it, particularly in the south of NATO. And I think NATO will find itself becoming a sort of North European grouping where, I mean, you know, Poland, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Scandinavian countries, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, Britain would all be very strong on NATO. Mm -hmm. Germany would do what it does best, which is dither. The French would come up with a, uh, a plan that nobody understood and that was, was around, based around French national interests, not common interests. I mean, that's the way they are at the moment. And so NATO would look pretty sick after one or two years of a Trump presidency without Trump actually doing anything. And the danger of that is that we've got to think about that in advance and think, OK, so let's accept a possible reality that NATO starts to look different. In what way can we still maintain a deterrent? And if that is the case, then the chances are, in our own interests, Britain will have to do rather more than we think if Trump is not, not elected than if he is. And if he is elected, then Britain is one of the countries that really does have to step up to the plate in order to maintain that uh, NATO. NATO is still the most impressive alliance the world has ever yeah. seen, ever in world history. It's a, an astonishing organisation. But like all astonishing organisations, it could actually collapse very quickly if uh, the members of it don't think about what it really means and are prepared to put the backing behind it when it's required. Well, let, let, let's finish where we, where we started then with um, General Sir Patrick Sanders' comments about, about yeah. the state of the army, and, and we, can, we can broaden that out yeah. to the military itself. I mean, can we point a finger of blame uh, for, for, the, for what I, I think we both would agree is the, the kind of the parlous state of our armed forces right now? Or, or is it more a case of, you know, death by a thousand cuts? Yeah, it is. It's death by a thousand cuts. I mean, the, the, the era that we've lived through is changing. That's the point. We, we, we all know this. We're going into a new era. And it, that, that comes hard to our understanding. You know, the peace dividend is over. In the 1970s, we spent about the same on defence as we spent on health. That was about, about it. That was mm -hmm. the Cold War. By the year 2000, we were spending half as much on defence as we spend on health. By 2020, we're spending a quarter on defence what we spend on health. And that's the peace dividend. That's absolutely fine in times of peace. But if we now think we're moving into times of potential war, the peace dividend is over. We've got to rebalance. And I'm not saying we've got to cut the health budget, but somehow we've got to find more money for 
a, a, a defense establishment which looks more like the Cold War one we had in terms of size and extent if we are to deter the war which otherwise looks every year as if it's coming closer to us down the track. It certainly does. Uh, Michael, always great to have you on. Thanks very much indeed. And that is your lot for this special edition of the Sky News Daily. We'll see you again next time.